Guys, we're going to today celebrate uh, the season we are in and recognize again the absolute gift that God has given us. Because really this day is really a day of anticipation for most. It's, it's Christmas Eve. I don't know about you, but growing up in my household, Christmas Eve was like, can we get this over with and get to Christmas? So because we knew the gifts were around the tree. We knew that uh, the fun was ahead. And then I met Denise and their family had different traditions than my family. Did anyone that's married find that out that other people do things differently than you do? You thought you were the only one in the world that did stuff and they think the same. And they have this weird tradition. I, I really have still to this day not figured it out. But on Christmas Eve, it's a contest. Who can call the other one first and yell, Christmas Eve gift in the phone? But there is no Christmas Eve gift. And I'm thinking, that's like a Christmas Eve curse at like 6 in the morning, you know. So this morning, I won. Alarm goes off. I roll over. I'm like, we have this happen on Sundays, like happy Sunday. I'm like, Christmas Eve gift. She's like, you dog. I know. I got her. I beat her for one time in our whole marriage. I finally got on top there. But uh, whatever your Christmas has, we're so glad you were able to be with us. I know, had, I know some of you had your, your, cha your plans changed. I know that uh, there are a lot of people that have been sitting at the airports a long time <laughs> wishing they were doing something else. But you're here today, so I encourage you to relax, enjoy this time as we get into God's Word. So we're going to look at the, the story we've been walking through uh, the last several weeks as we've been looking at the wise men. Uh, the, the sermon in the series has been titled The Thrill of Hope, and it came out of that last song we sang, which I love, O Holy Night. But you know, I don't know what it was about the Christmas hymns, and I think a lot of the old hymns, they were written for people that can sing really high or really low, because there's no in-between. And I was listening to David as now, I'm like, bless you, man. You did all right, because that's uh, that old divine, especially soft, that's tough. But in that setting, it speaks of what the world was like when Jesus came. And it really speaks about the setting we find ourselves in today. It talks about this weary world in sin and error pining. People are trying to find light. They're trying to find truth. They're trying to find hope. And, and yet we're not always looking in the right places. And and then it says in the song, till he appeared and his soul felt its worth, because really that's what he brought to us, incredible value, incredible meaning. We, we are his sons and daughters, amen? We've been bought by the most precious price in the world, those of us who are followers of Christ by the blood of Jesus. And it says in that song that uh, a thrill of hope, the weary soul rejoices. And I believe today there are so many people that are weary that need to know Jesus, there are so many people that know Jesus that are weary and they need to get their eyes back on him. And we've been looking at that and saying, well, what is the hope that he brings? What is the hope that we find in the Christmas story? Because in our culture, if we're not careful, we can get caught up in all the wrappings and trappings of Christmas and forget all about the fact that it's about the Savior of our world, our, our King, our Lord coming to be with us. Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. We are so fortunate, aren't we? We're so blessed that God sent his one and only son, not to condemn us, but that through him we might be saved. And now on this side of the cross and this side of the resurrection, now not only we have God with us, we have God in us because he sent his Holy Spirit. And everywhere we are, God is with us. So we've been looking through the story in Matthew's gospel of the Magi, the, the wise men. Most people would say the three wise men. I actually went home this week and looked at our own little manger scene and sure enough, there are Three wise men there, and they're bowing down to a baby Jesus, which, as I've shared, is not necessarily true. Uh, in fact, the story happened about a year to a year and a half after Jesus' birth, so most likely they were bowing down to a toddler, as we were sharing last week. But they were bringing gifts, and the gifts were what was important. They were unique gifts. They were special gifts. I believe they were God-ordained gifts because they had purpose in the life of Mary and Joseph and Jesus in the moment, but they also projected they also foretold the hope that Jesus would bring. Pick it up in verse 10. If you have your Bibles, it'll be on the screen. It says, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, maybe tomorrow somebody will get some gold, but I doubt anybody's getting frankincense or myrrh. Frankincense, okay. Myrrh, not so much. And we've been looking at these unique gifts, and we've been saying, what does it mean to us? What are we supposed to get out of that story in the Bible? Because as Matthew recounted, these, these wise men traveled some over 800 miles. They, they traveled most likely from Persia. Most historians believe they were not Jews. They were of the Gentile race. They were coming because their studies of the ancient texts, of the prophecies, said a king was coming. 
Their studies told them that he would not be an ordinary king because already many kings had come and gone because earthly kings just come and go. But he was going to be not only the king, but he was going to be the king of the world. But not only the king of the world, he was going to be the son of God. And they thought that was important enough to get up and go and travel from afar that led them into Jerusalem into Herod's court, seeking the, 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 the newborn king. They saw the star. They finally found themselves to Bethlehem, and there they came to worship him. And I want to make sure you understand that the greatest response we should have at Christmas is to worship our Lord and our Savior. They came to worship him. And in their worship, they gave you and I a pattern. I love finding patterns in the Word of God. They gave us a pattern and understanding what worship is. You know, I, I, I really stand amazed sometimes when I get a chance to over coffee, hear a lot of your stories, especially those of you that were raised not in a Christian setting or raised in a country where maybe it was, it was Christianity was on the uh, hidden away over here, and, it, and the worship cost something. It, it meant something more than just culturally showing up to church on Sundays. It cost something. And for them, it cost something. They literally had to seek out truth, and that is a big part of our worship, isn't it? The, Jesus said in the, in the, in the story with the, the woman at the well, he said, they will worship me in spirit, and they will also worship me in truth. And our worship should always be about truth. It should always be about who he is, what he's done, and what he's doing in us now. And that alone should drive us to our knees to honor the King of Kings. Their worship involved obedience, because that is the absolute highest form of expression we, of love to our God there is. If we love him, we will obey his commandments. It is a joy to do so. It's not, a, it's not a duty. It's a joy because it comes out of a love that he has for us and a love we have for him. They bowed at the side of Jesus. Guys, we should be the most humble people in the world. Christians have uh, kind of missed that in the last several years. We should be the most humble people in the world because God did not call us to come reign over other people. He called us to come up under them and serve them just as Jesus did. And when we think of the posture of Christianity, it's just that, it's coming up under the oppressed, coming up under the broken, coming up under the weak and the weary and serving them. Not standing over and looking down and commanding or judging. No, it's always coming under. And that's why our worship comes out of humility. It comes out of that place of saying, God, I don't, I don't know what goes through your head sometimes, but we're singing songs like, God, I don't even deserve to stand here. But you counted me worthy. And you sense your only son, and you're not, you're not looking upon me because of my goodness. I'm looking upon you because of your goodness. And because of that, I bring you worship. And the last part of this, uh, of their worship pattern, is they, they gave. There was a generosity. There was precious gifts, this act of devotion. So again, they had a costly worship. They, they brought something because he was the king of kings and lord of lords. Now, just to go back and, and look real quickly, they brought him three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. If you remember a few weeks ago, we talked about frankincense, actually an oil that a lot of people enjoy today, but yet it was a very special oil in those days because it was used in the mixture for the incense in the tabernacle of the temple. And it was lit on fire when the priests were bringing in the sacrifice on the day of atonement that would, the, the smoke that would rise up from the incense, that smell of frankincense represented the prayers of God's people. And because of that, we see the foreshadowing of Jesus Christ being the great high priest the one who goes before the Father, even today, and makes intercession for you and I. Maybe you didn't know that. Jesus is praying for you. Jesus standing, I'm sitting next to the Father right now, and you may be going through great pain. He's like, Father, I know what that feels like. You may be going through abandonment. He goes, been there. You may be going through uncertainty. Got that one. Why? Because he suffered in every way. He was tempted in every way we are, yet without sin. And therefore, he became our perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God. Last week, we talked about myrrh, a very strange gift to give a toddler, because myrrh primarily was an analgesic. It was used in the, in the burial of people. It was an embalming uh, ointment. But in the, in the day-to-day, -day, uh, it's too, too funny. I didn't share it last week, but really it did make sense for a, 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 a toddler because it was kind of the decedent of the day, if someone knows what I'm talking about. So by diaper rash, we've got myrrh. So it, it kind of made some sense. But really, it was projecting the fact that he was going to be our suffering servant. We looked at Isaiah 53. Man, he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are what? Help me out. Healed. 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 Praise God. We're healed. We stand today knowing that our God wants wholeness in our lives. He wants wholeness in our minds. He wants wholeness in our relationships. 
Today we turn to the, to the last gift. I don't know if it was last in order. I don't know if it was first in order. The Bible just said gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But today we turn to the one that most people would say, I'd like some of that. And that is gold, representing that he was to be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. But what do we know about kings? I mean, we think about it, all this in the Bible, we're always looking and say, well, what does that do for me? Well, we, we don't really do well with kings. In fact, in America, in our history, we got rid of the king, right? We, uh, we, we rebelled against kingdoms, and, and God forbid some man would have authority over our lives and tell us how we are to live and, and, and in his own whims and emotions change things on a whim because he is the king. We don't do well with kings. In fact, kings in our history have been self-serving. Kings in our history have been greedy. Kings in our history have been bent on building their power on the backs of their subjects. But Jesus came as a king like no other. In, in our culture, again, the thought of a king sounds more like the stuff of Hollywood or, or the stuff of Madison Avenue that, we, that, that in, the more than reality we would embrace. I mean, in America, we don't have kings unless you're going to get a hamburger and you might run into this guy. <laughs> Creepy king. King of kings. Oh, if you like movies and you like great old movies, you might have King Kong, right? You know, the, the giant ape that climbed the, the towers and fought off the planes. You can take the creepy guy off. He's creepy enough. Because the next one is even creepier, but I'm not going to put a picture up. Because if you like to read scary things or watch scary things, who might have written that? Stephen King. And I, for one, do not partake. I'm not, I'm not into scary things. I do not do that. If you like music and you like little blues, there's always... Someone help me out, who? B.B. King, right? If you like little jazz, there's also someone with King in his name, and he is? Oh, someone's good today. Nat King Cole. In basketball, they claim there's a king, that he's supposedly the best, but being from Carolina, we know better. LeBron, the king, James. Come on. Everybody's shaking their head. Y'all are good today because we all know Michael Jordan's the best. But anyway... The world has had many kings. The world has had many kings. But Jesus came as a king like no other. And I want to talk about that king today. You see, Jesus is not a person that came to just carry out his will. He's not a person that came to establish his power. He's not a king that came to build a kingdom on the backs of his subjects. No, he is the son of God who literally came to be our savior. He is the king of kings, the word says. He is the Lord of lords. There's no greater than him. He's the supreme authority over all powers, all dominions. People sometimes try to project that evil is greater. No, evil cowers at the name of Jesus. Darkness flees at the name of Jesus. He is not less than anyone. He is greater than all, yet he came as a servant to us all. He is a king like no other. He didn't come to build a kingdom on us. Sometimes we get that backwards in the church of Jesus Christ. Well, we're, we're saved to serve him. Well, there's truth to that. But it's not we're saved to serve him to build his kingdom. No, he came to bring his kingdom to us. In all of its provision, in all of its joy, in all of its blessing, in all of its preciousness, he brought it to us, not so that we would sacrifice to gain it, but because he sacrificed to give it. And now we partake in the kingdom of God. And oh, we spread the kingdom of God. In fact, the message of the gospel is just that. The kingdom is here. It's among us. Lord, may your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. At his birth, people were looking for a king. The Bible makes it clear. I mean, the, the, the prophets, they had, they'd seen the scripture. They knew a king was coming. King Herod, he was told a king was coming, and all he did was respond in fear. Even the people, they were expecting a king, but not a king that was like Jesus. They, they never thought their king would be born in a, in a cave around barn animals. They expected him to be born in a palace with robes and, and royal linens and, and, and the greatest of everything around him. No, no, they couldn't have a king that was a peasant. They couldn't have a king. And, you know, truthfully, we look back at that and we'd expect the same. In our culture, he'd be born in a, in a big mansion somewhere. He'd have, he'd have lunch. He'd have little gold little shoes when he was born if he was going to be the king because we, we conflate power with excess. But, no, he came as a child born in a manger in a cave. And you see, the problem with Israel in that day is though they longed for a king, no one expected a king like Jesus. Though they longed for a king, no one could accept a king like Jesus. They didn't expect the Messiah to be the born, the son of a carpenter. And, and oh, by the way, born in Nazareth? 
Even Nathaniel, who became a disciple of Christ, when he was told, hey, come see this guy. He's from Nazareth. He goes, are you kidding me? That's, that's my translation of the Bible. He's saying, can anything good be, come from Nazareth? You've got to be joking, right? They expected a king, but, but they expected one who would, who would work with and elevate the already powerful to bring peace through war and to restore Israel or reestablish Israel. That's what they were expecting. But that's not our king. We have a king like no other. No one predicted that the king of glory, the son of God, would, would befriend the outcast. He would touch the lepers. He would hang out with the, with the, the outcasts that the religious institutions had rejected. They never imagined a king who would bring around him uneducated fishermen and despise tax collectors and rebellious troublemakers and say, these are my disciples. These are the ones I'm going to train. They're going to turn the world upside down. They couldn't believe that a king would forgive a woman caught in the very act of adultery when the law said she should be stoned. But in the same king turned and judged greatly the religious nobles of that day and overturned the tables in the temple because they had turned it to a den of thieves. How dare they take a blessing for God and turn it into profit for themselves? You see, they never imagined the king would ride into Jerusalem one day on a donkey of all things, even though it was prophesied in the book of Isaiah. And those who were cheering him upon his revival, arrival were the very outcasts. They were the ones that, that knew that no one else cared. And they're saying, Hosanna, salvation has come. No one expected a king like Jesus. No one expected a king to stand trial on crimes for he didn't commit. He was innocent. And yet our king was tried and convicted and out of his judgment he was beaten, he was whipped, he was scourged, he was humiliated, and then he was hung on an instrument of torture, a cross, until he gave up his last breath. No one would imagine that. No one would imagine a king suffering on a cross who would look up to heaven with people, literally his creation, mocking him. And he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And I think of every one of us, and we've asked him to forgive us, I'm thinking he's saying the same thing. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know where sin leads. They don't know where that choice goes. They don't know the outcome of their choices. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. When they offered him a drink on the cross, and that's where the myrrh came in, they mixed it with wine to kind of dull the pain so he could just peacefully die. No, he said, no. No, thank you. Scripture records it this way, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, suffering its shame. What, what is the joy set before him? It's you and I. He knew what his, he knew what his sacrifice would bring. It'd bring hope. It'd bring, it'd bring freedom. It'd bring salvation. It'd bring life to you and I. So no one expected that. But yet when he cried out at his finish, he said to his father, I've done what you sent me for. Now my spirit, let it be received by you. He, he was done. No one expected a king like Jesus, but he was a king like no other. No one expected when he breathed his last, the sky would grow dark. An earthquake would shatter the earth and the world would lose hope and they would bury a dead king in a borrowed tomb. That's not how a king's supposed to be. But no one expected either, even though he had told it was going to happen, that on the third day the tomb was empty. Amen. No one expected when the women went to anoint the body. No one expected when they went out to pay homage to the dead king that he wasn't there anymore. No, there, there was no one in the grave. Hallelujah. He was living just like he said. That's our king. He's a king like no other. The king was risen from the dead, now sits at the right hand of the father. I tell you, we have a king like no other. This is an unusual Christmas message, I know. But what an unusual way for God to show his love for us. That he would send his one and only son to die for our sins. But yet the world didn't know what to do with him. And sadly, our world still doesn't know what to do with him. We still want him to rise up and take over. But he seeks to serve. In fact, he came not to serve, but to serve. And he calls us to do the same. Because after all, if you call yourself a follower of Christ, don't you understand that means you do what he did? You don't rewrite the history. You just do what he did. And that's what he came to do. And they didn't know how to respond to him. And I tell you, we don't know how to respond to him either, mostly. In fact, it's interesting to me, if you look through the Bible, there were kind of three common responses to Jesus during his day. Two of them, sadly, are, are, are counterproductive. And yet, so often, we even find ourselves there. The first one is when, when they decided to oppose him. King Herod did not want Jesus to be on this earth. He had heard the stories as well. The prophets told him what was happening. The priests in, in educated him. 
And all he knew is this baby is born and he's going to take my kingdom. And I'm going to fight to keep my kingdom. So the, the birth of Jesus, though we celebrated greatly in Bethlehem, it did not bring great joy. Because King Herod decreed that every baby under two years old, every baby boy, was to be put to death. And that's exactly what happened because our king showed up. You say, well, my, I don't oppose him, never have opposed him. But yet so often we do in our attitudes. I don't need anybody to show me how to live. I don't need to obey anybody's commands. I'll do my life my way. That, that's opposition to the king of kings. There's a second response. Oh, people that didn't necessarily oppose him, they just dismissed him. And that was the priests and the religious scholars of the day. They, they didn't oppose him as Jesus. They just dismissed him as king, even though they would read to each other out of Micah chapter 5 that a king was going to be born in Bethlehem. These same priests who would read it over and over again didn't bother traveling five miles down the road to go to the manger because surely that can't happen. And the same kind of thing happens to us today. We dismiss him because we can look at others and say, it's okay if he's your king, but you know what? I don't need that. I'm fine. I'm not opposed to Jesus. I just don't need him. I'm not opposed if you go to church. I just think y'all are, you know, cult or I think y'all are foolish. No, we dismiss him. But the better response is the one we've been talking about the last three weeks, and that is the response of worship. The response of worship that the wise men would bow down and worship Jesus as king. The ultimate response is to show reverence and awe and honor to the God of heaven who became one of us in the person of Jesus. But note this, because I think it's very important we understand this. These men were educated. They were wealthy. They would be the elite of the day. But they had no problem dropping on their knees in front of this king and presenting him with gifts in awe and wonder. See, worship. Is not just emotion. Worship is not just for people who are in a bad place. Worship is an is a act of recognition. There is a king above all kings, a lord above all lords, and I'm not it. And I choose to bow and I worship him. So I'm curious, and I ask you sincerely on this Christmas Eve, what's your response today? Maybe you found yourself in this spectrum from time to time. Maybe there's been a day where you opposed him. Maybe there's been a day you cursed him. Maybe there's been a day you dismissed, dismissed him. Maybe you're raised in a family that went to church and you couldn't wait to get out. Maybe you're tolerating your parents' faith right now. But can I tell you, there's only one response to the king that's going to make your life become what God created it to be, and that's when you worship him. That's when you learn to worship him. My story, I've shared with you before, for me, the, the thought of a babe in a manger didn't do a whole lot for me. Be honest. The thought of a babe in a manger was not the fact that drew me to him. What drew me to him was the fact that he was the king. And he would strip himself of glory from heaven. He was born of a virgin in poverty, in a cave, reaching out to the lowest of the low and those who were despised. If we were to put it in our day, in our, our understandings, our culture, he, and he would basically this. He, he would reach out to those who just can't get it right. He would reach out to those who are financially a mess. He would reach out to those whose relationships just never work out. And now they're in a bad place again because they're desperate and they're hungry for a relationship. He would reach out to those who use substances just to get by and try to find meaning in wrong places, going to bed longing for something more and hurting and feeling empty the next morning. That's who he came for. And that's the king that revealed himself to me at the age of 16 where I knew that I knew I had a choice. I either bow down and worship or I just thumb my nose and say, I, I just choose to do with my life my way. You see, he came for everyone. He came for you. He came for me. And he loved us from the very beginning, not, not because we were good or had something to offer. Because again, he didn't come to build a kingdom. The kingdom was already there. He came to invite us into his kingdom. Not because we were good, but because he was good. And he is good. Can I get an amen to that? He is good. And he forgives us, he cleanses us, and he brings us into his reality. Let me tell you about our king, and then we're going to worship him in a special way today. Listen, I don't know about you, maybe this is what you think, but if you think this way, it's wrong, okay? He is not some distant, angry, uninvolved judge waiting for you to mess up, waiting to bring the hammer. He's not the man upstairs, somebody, and he's not the big guy in the sky, neither is he your homeboy, He's not your eight pound, six ounce newborn baby Jesus either, okay? He's the righteous king of kings. He's the Lord of all lords. He's a king like no other. 
My Bible tells me he's the king of glory. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of all kings. My Bible tells me that Jesus the king is the one that heals the sick and opens blind eyes and heals deaf ears. He strengthens the weak and delivers the captive, restores those who are broken and hurting. He is our king. He's a shelter in the time of trouble. He is a light when your world is dark. He's the prince of peace, the lamb of God, the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. He's our king. He's the resurrection and the life. His goodness is indescribable. We cannot, with our very words, come close to describing how good he is. His power is incomprehensible. His, his grace is irresistible. At the, his name, darkness has to flee. Satan tried to defeat him. He squished him like a bug under his feet, and now he's under our feet. He came bringing power, but he came not to exert power for authority's sake. No, he brought power to set the captive free. He brought power to give us a better life. Satan tried to halt him, but he couldn't stop him. Death couldn't defeat him. The grave could not hold him. He's the king. And on this Christmas Eve, I just want you to know him. I just want you to know him. Could it be on this Christmas Eve that maybe the king of kings is moving on your heart right now? And I know tomorrow has presents. I know tomorrow has family and all that, but there's a greater gift. There's a greater gift, and that's accepting him. That's acknowledging him. That's worshiping him with your very life. You know, we've been focusing on Jesus and what he came to do. Yes, he's our suffering servant, and that's wonderful. But if that's all he was, we would just have a martyr to worship. There are a lot of martyrs in the world, but they're not the king of kings. He's the great high priest, still is the great high priest. And we're thankful for that, that we no longer have to go through somebody else to get to God. By the way, those that have come out of different faiths, I'm not your priest. I'm just going to make it a little clear, okay? You have full access to the throne room of grace. Why? Because he gave us his righteousness. The king took off his robe when you came to him and he put it around you. He took off his, his glory and enveloped you in it. So that when you're in a time of need, you come to the throne of grace with our God, our Father, and you come boldly into that throne and as a son or daughter. And the Bible says he doesn't reject us. He doesn't say sit over there until I deal with the more important people. No, he says you'll find grace and mercy in your time of need. You see, whether we acknowledge it or not, and whether you've ever acknowledged it, he is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. And one day, the entire world, the entire creation will bow down before him. Every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And my hope is on this Christmas Eve, you decide to do that now and not till one day where you have to. So I want to pray for you. And then we're going to celebrate communion together because... Unless he's your king, communion is just a religious act. It's like going to church, put a star on the chart. But if he's your king, oh, what a joy. What a celebration. Oh, listen, believer, let me talk to you this morning before we pray. There are many I know that, man, you are happy. He, are, he is your savior, but you're not living like he is your king at all. That's a bad place to be. Because basically that means you've accepted a gift, but you're choosing to live on your own. And we just don't do well with that. Maybe you gruff up and say, well, Mike, I don't want anybody telling me what to do. None of us do. But when you understand how good he is and what he's done, we joyfully submit. Because in him we find life and life more abundantly.